In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, it's always a blessing for me to be here uh, among all of you, especially during St. Mary's Fast, um, to continue the theme that we've been speaking about in the revival, um, the titles of Christ. We're going to be speaking about one of the more famous of titles, um, and it's related to the way that we relate to God um, as He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. When we refer to Him as the Good Shepherd, and, and He, of course, said this about Himself, identifying what His role is to us. How is it that He sees us, and how He sees His relationship to us and our relationship to Him? So, at first, I wanted to just very quickly give kind of an overview of shepherds and shepherding. Uh, and sheep uh, at that time, and how people, um, how people considered the shepherds. Actually, shepherds were considered uh, very, um, not, not, very, not regarded very highly, um, but the sheep were very defenseless, and God made it very clear that this kind of animal, the sheep, uh, when he kind of compares us to the sheep, says something about how he sees us, that we are very, very defenseless, um, totally dependent on the shepherd. If you leave a group of sheep by themselves, they'll all wander and scatter and go around and maybe fall into a pit, um, and there'll be no one to protect them or to save them, which is why they're in need of a shepherd. They're always subject to danger, and the danger comes in many forms, and there are a great many things that are dangerous for the sheep, even rushing water, heavy rainfall, um, of course, robbers, people are coming to steal the sheep, and wolves um, as well to, to eat the sheep. Um, and anyone who owned the sheep would have to have a shepherd in order to protect the sheep um, from falling into any of these pitfalls or being killed. And so some of the, the owners of the sheep, they would be shepherds themselves. And other owners of sheep, they would hire someone to be the shepherd on their behalf. And so Christ, when he speaks about, and we're going to read the passage when he speaks about him being the good shepherd, um, he speaks about how that the person who is not the owner of the sheep who he refers to as the hireling, the one who is hired in order to protect the sheep, he does not have the same zeal or love for the sheep as the shepherd himself does, uh, as, as, as the one who owns the sheep. He's the one who cares for the sheep. But the hireling is one who, uh, maybe when there's a threat coming to attack the sheep, puts himself in danger, he flees and runs, um, rather than risk uh, his life for the sake of the sheep. Um, over time, uh, whenever sheep would have a shepherd for some time, they begin to learn the voice of the, she of the shepherd and they would respond to his voice. When they hear him calling, when they see him, they would recognize him. They recognize him as a source of good and protection and safety. When they hear his voice, they would follow after him. Um, so uh, what is it that we can learn from this passage, we're going to read it together, um, the famous passage, passage where the Lord is speaking about himself as being the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So what are some things that we can learn, can maybe extract from this passage and understand together what are the characteristics of this good shepherd? The first, of course, which is very clear, is out of all of the possible analogies that the Lord could have used to describe us as his children, um, as his people, he uses the example of sheep. And this says something about our capabilities compared to him. Um, again, sheep are very weak, are helpless, are vulnerable, are quick to fall, are easily deceived, are in need of leadership and direction, um, in all these ways, the Lord is sending us a message saying, we are in need of these things. Uh, we are easily deceived by Satan. We're easily deceived even by our own hearts. Uh, we are quick to fall into temptation whenever we experience even slight temptation. Sometimes we find ourselves falling immediately. Also, sometimes we tend to commit the same mistakes and, and failures again and again and again. Um, being vulnerable as we are to the attack of Satan and to the temptation of Satan and to the temptations of our own heart. 
In Isaiah 53, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Like sheep without a shepherd that are scattered, that everyone goes in their own direction. Um, not very clever, not very smart, not very aware of the dangers around, and that if a sheep by itself, because of its vulnerable nature, were to travel by itself somewhere, it could be very easily attacked or consumed or stolen. So the first thing we learn is he sees us as sheep, meaning we are in need of assistance. We are in need of salvation. We are in need of help. We cannot protect ourselves or guard ourselves or guide ourselves alone. And this is the first important thing to understand because unless we see ourselves this way, unless we identify ourselves as truly being sheep, then we feel like we have no need for the shepherd. Whenever a person believes that they know what is the path of life they should walk, when they know how is it they should live their life, when they feel like they understand everything about everything, uh, no, why is a shepherd coming? I don't need a shepherd. A shepherd is someone who is going to impose on me certain rules, certain restrictions. The sheep wants to go left, the shepherd says go right. Well, unless I trust the shepherd, unless I believe that the shepherd is good and has my best interests, then when he tells me to go right, I will refuse, I will reject, I will resist, I will say, no, I want to go left, I don't want to go right. But the sheep who recognizes themselves, who has a good self-understanding, knows that they are weak, knows that they have limited vision, knows that they don't know what's best for them, then even though maybe their senses tell them, I want to go left, but say, the, well, the shepherd tells me I need to go right. So I need to follow the shepherd, even if um, it's difficult or confusing or I don't understand the shepherd is telling me where I should go This is the direction I should go. So it's the first point is we are sheep Second is he is the good shepherd. He says I am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep meaning the, the, the actions of the shepherd are are made for the good of the sheep the shepherd exists for the good of the sheep the shepherd serves the sheep even though the shepherd has, of course, a higher rank and position than the sheep, the, sh the shepherd is, is, not, is not vulnerable or weak like the sheep are, but the purpose of the shepherd is to serve the sheep, is to guide the sheep, is to lead the sheep for the sake of the well-being of the sheep. And so God's actions toward us are also for our well-being. He does not command us or try to rule over us because he wants authority. He does not seek us to worship him because somehow he is um, thinking that, that he is in need of someone to elevate him or to puff him up or to make him feel like, like he, has, he has followers and that he is powerful. He doesn't need any of this. And actually, he never even needed to create us to begin with. But everything that he does toward us is out of love. It is not for selfish reasons. It is not to exercise authority. But he seeing that we are unable to, to, to lead ourselves, unable to serve ourselves, unable to do what is good and necessary, he provides for us and he comes and he gives to us. And so he wants a good outcome for us. In Psalm 55, it says, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. This is the work of the shepherd. And the, the shepherd identifies and sees all of the dangers around us. Maybe one of the characteristics of the sheep is they're kind of oblivious to danger. The sheep could be in a very dangerous situation, but they are not even aware. They are not even thinking that there is danger around, and so they are not on guard. They are not alert. They are not prepared. They're just living their life simply, but it, it needs someone else that is overlooking the flock and seeing and protecting and, and observing so that they can um, protect the sheep. So he is the good shepherd and his motives are good. His, no, his motives are protection. His motives are to lead us. The third point is, and maybe why the shepherd is so important, is that there are wolves, right? He says the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The wolves are the dangers that we experience in life. And maybe as human beings, we are pretty good at identifying physical danger. Physical danger and the form of someone seeking to attack us, physical danger in terms of some kind of natural disaster. In many ways, our senses express to us the physical dangers of the world around us that maybe instinctively cause us to protect ourselves or to be prepared. But there is a worse kind of danger, which is the spiritual danger, that is actually far more threatening uh, and much more difficult for us to detect. Spiritual dangers are very hidden 
and especially when the devil is coming to tempt a sheep, um, he does so in a, in a very clever way. The devil has infinite patience, you know, and all it takes is for us to fall once and not to get up again. Maybe the devil prepares us our entire life for the fall that he is planning for us. This is why that even though maybe for a time maybe we look at our lives and we see that we are living life in the right way, we are living life um, in uh, the fear of God, but this should not puff us up. This should not make us to feel that simply because I'm living in the fear of God today that I will continue to do so tomorrow. Why? Because the wolves will come and the wolves are around us and the wolves are always attacking, sometimes in a very clear and overt way, but sometimes in a very secret and hidden way. And this is where we need the shepherd especially, all the more, because the, 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 the dangers and the threats are real. The, the wolves seek to scatter the sheep. And this is done in two ways. If the devil can convince a sheep on its own to leave the flock, then he has won. Because he makes the sheep to feel that he does not need the rest of the flock and he does not need the shepherd. He's going to go off on himself and he's going to get himself in trouble and he chooses to leave. Another way that maybe the wolves, they scatter the sheep is they divide the sheep. You know, there is strength in numbers. And if the wolf is able to divide the flock into smaller and smaller factions and groups and they are not united together, we find that the flock being divided and in conflict with one another begins to fall. And actually Christ said this himself. He said any kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And so one of the ways that actually the devil has victory over us and one of the, the big wolves that comes against us is the, the conflicts and the divisions. Whether it be the divisions in the church, and we see maybe the fragmentation of the church into many, many, many different denominations, um, or the fragmentation of the family, the separation of the family, and the lack of unity in the family or in the marriage or relationship between parents and children. There's all kinds of places where we find division and conflict in the world, and these are definitely wolves. Wolves that don't appear maybe as dangerous to us in the moment, but over time, the devil uses these divisions and conflicts to separate and to weaken us even more. These spiritual attacks um, maybe can be very gradual, can be something that is not an acute threat. It is not like a person who comes into my house with a weapon. Um, and I feel like I'm an immediate threat and I have to protect myself. No, this is a kind of threat where the devil makes us to believe that a certain lifestyle, um, we can continue to live in, in a certain lifestyle without any fear of falling away, without any fear of apostasy, without any fear of a long-term damage that happens to us. When we begin to live a life that is filled with um, addictions and bad habits and unrepented sins and doing what we know is wrong and yet toying with sin and living in a life of sin, believing that it will not have any permanent impact or damage on who we are. But over time, we begin to see how these sins and these struggles begin to really manifest in our life. Things can seem to start in a very simple or innocent way or the experimentation and the toying of sin that does not have any long-term impact. But in the end, it is vicious. When St. Paul is speaking to the Ephesians about the spiritual enemies, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And I don't know about you, but I cannot see any of these. Throughout my day, when I'm living my life, I don't stop and I say, Oh, look, there's some principalities and powers. You know, there's some uh, rulers of darkness, there's spiritual hosts of wickedness. I don't identify any of them. I don't see them. I go through my day feeling like all there is is the world. All my senses tell me is the world, the world that is around me. I don't recognize all of these wicked enemies that are hiding in wait in order to destroy me. And this is the way that the devil operates. But the shepherd, the shepherd sees them. Maybe also in the example, the sheep don't see the enemies coming. The sheep don't identify the wolves from a distance. They are very simple and they're only looking down and they're eating their grass and doing what is it that they do. The shepherd is the one who's looking up. The shepherd is the one who's paying attention to the environment and seeing what are the enemies that are coming. The sheep that rely on the shepherd will be protected from the enemies. But the sheep that rely only on themselves, maybe they don't even pay attention as these enemies are approaching until it is too late. So the wolves are of nature that we cannot fight them. 
the wolves, the spiritual enemies, are of a nature that we cannot overcome them. By definition, as made of dust human beings, we are unable to conquer the spiritual enemies. And this is what St. Paul is trying to make very clear. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Maybe if we strengthen ourselves enough, we could win a wrestling competition with flesh and blood. But there is no way to win a competition against the rulers of darkness. Christ says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Meaning the nature of these wolves are hidden. The nature of these wolves are hidden. They are not obvious. They are not to be seen quickly. They are not to be identified easily. It requires a lot of self-examination, a lot of discernment, discrimination in the world to understand what is edifying and what is not edifying for me. What should I allow myself to do? Who should I allow myself to befriend? Where should I allow myself to go? And thinking that all of these decisions, um, I can make decisions however I please and it will not have a long-term impact. This is the deception. This is the ravenous wolves, that they come to devour us, believing we can live our life a certain way, against God's commandment, but without any consequence. He goes on then, and he speaks about the hireling. He says, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees because he does not care about the sheep. Who is this hireling? The hireling are the things that we go to for protection that fail us, the things that we seek protection from, the things that we seek comfort from, the things that we think are going to alleviate our stress, are going to make us feel better, are going to give us hope, are going to make us happy in this life, but that when we go to them, we find that they, they have false promises. They don't actually help us. They don't actually save us. They don't actually give any comfort whatsoever, but they betray us at the last minute. And so maybe when we follow them, they actually lead us to disaster. The responses to temptation that sometimes we employ, that sometimes we try to go to, to protect ourselves from, um, from sadness, to protect ourselves from stress and to deal with our stress, they can actually lead us into further darkness, into further bondage and slavery to sin. And so these hirelings are powerless. They are powerless um, to help us. And the devil weaponizes them against us. The devil uses these false idols, these mute idols that we seek after in order to, um, to, to allow us to place our trust in them and then in the end they provide us nothing in return. Maybe these things, they cater to our immediate and short-term desires. They grant us the desires of our heart in the moment. They make us to feel good or happy in the moment. Even things that are sinful feel good. And that's actually why we fall into sin. We don't fall into sin because it feels bad. We fall into sin because it is pleasurable, because it is desirable, because it is something that we want, because it's something that we believe is going to grant us goodness. And maybe this is a kind of hireling, something that we go to instead of the shepherd, asking for protection and safety and goodness from this thing. But in the long run, it only leads to addiction and sadness. It only leads to destruction and sorrow. And we find we're giving our heart away to someone else other than the shepherd this hireling who are in the first moment will run away when danger comes and will provide no protection or safety. The Lord said, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. This is the promise of the shepherd, the good shepherd, the one who is He's, he's offering himself to us. He says, if you want to, a way through the darkness, if you want a way through your sadness, if you want to be healed of your brokenness, come to me and I will lead you out of darkness. Sadly, maybe the path that the Lord is wanting us to walk, to be led out of darkness, is a difficult one. You know, and he says that we should follow the narrow road, this narrow way that the Lord is calling us to. It is not a wide road. It is not an easy road. The way out of, out of darkness into light is not necessarily a comfortable road. And the reason is, is that we are broken with sin. We, we, are, we are sick with the sickness of sin. And sometimes when a person is sick, they have to be cured with a difficult treatment. And this treatment, God maybe grants trials 
and, and, and different types of suffering in our life to purify us and transform us and change us, to lead us out from darkness into light. The process is not necessarily an easy one, but it is the one that is guaranteed. It is one that the Lord promises that if we continue faithfully with Him, that He will lead us out of this darkness into the light and bring the blind by a way they did not know. And the reason this is important is because we as blind, we see ourselves as blind, then we can say, I do not know the path. Again, why do we need the shepherd? We need the shepherd because we do not know the path. We don't know the, the way that God is leading us to where we want to go. We are blind in darkness, but the shepherd can see. Those who place their trust in the shepherd, even when they are in darkness or sadness, God will lift them up out of it and lead them to the promised land, lead them to a good place, a land of milk and honey. Whereas the person who trusts only in themselves, though they be blind, will stumble around from here to there trying to find a solution or an answer, and they will never find it. The Lord goes on and he says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. This is also very critical and important because Christ is expressing his care for us based on his personal knowledge based on his understanding of who we are as individuals, not just for the salvation of the church as a whole, as an entity, as an organization, or as a body, but the body is made of individuals. The body is made of individual souls, individual people, and he acts in our best interests for each of us as individuals because he knows what's best for us, and he calls, them each, he calls us each by name. In Psalm 139, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. So again, when we are looking at the shepherd, the shepherd who seems to do and operate in ways that we don't understand sometimes, who wants to lead us down a path that we don't know, that restricts us from going down the path that we think is good for us, and he says, no, don't go down that path. I want you to go down this other path. He does so with knowledge. He does so with understanding. He does so because he understands not only us, but he understands and knows the future. He knows that if we walk down the paths that we have chosen for ourselves, that maybe they would lead to disaster. And so he, he closes off those roads. He says no to those roads. If the sheep looks at the shepherd with anger, with resentment, and says, I resent you because you have not allowed me to walk the path that I have chosen for myself, and rose and runs on their own down the path that they have chosen, maybe they will end up in disaster. But the sheep who trust the shepherd and says, though I do not see, and though I do not understand, I still trust that you know me, and you know what is good for me, and I will follow you. One of the problems that we have as human beings is that we compare ourselves to children. And we look at the children and we say, well, these children, they don't know what's best for them, they don't know what's good for them, we have to tell them what to do. We have to tell them what is right and we expect children to follow us and obey us. But then when it comes to us before God, we consider ourselves not to be children. We consider ourselves to be adults and mature, knowing the truth and knowing what is good. And maybe we shake our fists at God when he tells us or allows us to pass through different things that we don't agree with or we didn't want. And we think ourselves to be mature and adults, even to him. But this, of course, is foolishness. Like, what are we compared to him? So the sheep that is following the shepherd identifies and knows that it is uh, insufficient and that it is weak and that it does not have what it takes and does not have the knowledge. It does not know how to lead itself. It needs the shepherd to lead and trust the shepherd because the shepherd has intimate knowledge and care for who we are, each of us as individuals. Of course, Christ, when he spoke about the lost sheep, he said he will leave the 99 sheep to go after the one sheep. You know, may maybe we find this very difficult in our own life, you know, if you, if you had 99% of the people that you cared about there present, if a Sunday school servant had 99% of their class, maybe our response would be joy, like we're happy, like everyone is here, you know, everyone is present. But think if it was your own children. You know, if you have 10 children, it's a lot of children. If you have 10 children and one of those children is missing, are you going to be happy? Or are you going to be sad? Are you going to be so happy saying, I'm so happy that nine of my children was here. I don't know where the other one is. They could be anywhere. I, they're not answering their phone. I don't know where they are. But at least I have nine children. Nine children is good enough. It's a lot of children, right? No, no parent would think this way. 
Actually, they would leave the nine children and they would go searching for the one because they love each of the children. And having nine present is not a sufficient joy to say, okay, well, I can just lose one. It's only 10%. It's not, it's not very many, right? Nobody thinks this way. No parent, no, no one who loves would think this way. And this is the way the shepherd feels toward us. He, doesn't, he cares about each individual. Let's say all of the world became Christian. You know, how many people are there? Eight billion people now? Let's say eight billion became Christian, but there was one who didn't. I think the Lord would sorrow over that one. That one person who, who, who still did not believe. He would leave the eight billion to go to the one. And this shows us the compassion and the kindness of the shepherd. And that the Lord who knows us and he seeks us and, and pursues us. He also says, I am known by my own. Meaning the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Right? The, the sheep look at the shepherd and they know him and they understand him. Maybe they don't understand all his ways. Maybe they don't understand why he has certain judgments. Maybe they don't understand why he chooses for them certain things. Maybe these are big questions. I don't know why the shepherd is leading us down this path. I don't know why he wants us to go this way. But I trust that wherever he leads is good. And this is the, um, this is the recipe for contentment and peace in life. If you believe that God is leading you down a good path, then it doesn't matter what happens to you. Because whatever it is that happens, God is leading you to good. But if you are questioning the shepherd, if the sheep is questioning the shepherd, then you will always be questioning. You will always be doubting. You will always be complaining. You will always be grumbling. Because the path that the shepherd leads you is maybe different than the one that you would have led yourself. In John 17, it says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This knowledge of God... Right? He says, I am known by my own. The knowledge of Christ is eternal life. Like heaven is not a physical place. It is not just a location. It is, it is the, the presence of God with us. This is why when Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Now, how is it that the kingdom of heaven is within you? If, if heaven is far away in a different place, how is it the kingdom of heaven is within you? When we have the Holy Spirit in us, then we become heaven. Then the Lord is dwelling in us and our experience with him and our knowledge of him as the shepherd, it becomes clear and obvious to us and our relationship with him and our fellowship with him. Also in Philippians 3.8, he says, I, Yet indeed I also count all these things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. What St. Paul is saying is there is no way to know Christ unless we let go of the things that are against him. Meaning, if we want truly to know God, to know Christ, to have a relationship with Him, we cannot do so while holding on to all the things that He hates. We can't do so while holding on to all the things that distract us and lead us away from Him. And this is sadly what we often try to do. We want all the worldly success, and we want also all the spiritual success. We want to satisfy our flesh in every way, but also we want to have a close relationship with God. We want to be extremely wealthy and have all kinds of possessions, but we also want to be spiritually wealthy. Well, sometimes those two things aren't compatible. It is not wrong to be physically wealthy, but, but the, you know, the scripture says that those who desire to be rich, for them it is a snare. It is, it is a trap. How is it that we can hold on to all things that are in the world, but then we also want to hold on all the things that are Christ? You know, when we read after the Catholic epistle, do not love the world or the things in the world, for the world is passing away, right? The world is passing away. Christ is leading us away from the world. He is leading us from a, from a world that is about to be destroyed and falling apart. He's leading us to a heavenly place, a place that has no destruction or sorrow or sadness. It is then up to me to decide which path do I choose. When we look at Lot's wife, what is it that Lot's wife did? Well, she knew that her life was in Sodom. Her, her life was there. All of her possessions, her home, everything that she had built was in Sodom. Christ said, I'm I'm, God said, I'm leading you to something else. I'm leading you away from the destruction. Yes, it has everything that you own, but I'm offering you a better life, a life free from that, a life of goodness, and not a, a life of lust after the worldly things. But as she was leaving, instead of looking forward to the life that she was receiving from God, she looked backward at the life that she was leaving behind and she turned into a pillar of salt. So what is it that we are really seeking? What is it that I really want? I want the best of both. I want to have all of the worldly things. I want to have all the worldly 
pleasures. I want to have all of my worldly desires met. While at the same time, I want heaven. And I want to have the, the Holy Spirit working in me. How do we attain both? Christ said you cannot serve both God and mammon. Leave behind the things that are against God and you will find yourself rising up to God. If you don't leave behind the things that are against God, if you don't leave behind the distractions, you will find yourself stagnant. And you will be like a sheep that is unable to follow the shepherd because you are enjoying the pasture too much. When it's time for the shepherd to say, it's time to move on from here. It's time to go to a different place. And you will say, no, I enjoy, I enjoy grazing. I enjoy being here. I don't want to follow you. Go on on your own. And then, of course, that sheep leaves themselves subject to attack and they're vulnerable. The shepherd sacrifices himself for the sheep. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. And this is something when you think about in any religion, the deity of the religion. In what way does the deity bless the believers? In what way does the deity give? In what way does the deity demonstrate love for the believers of that religion? When you have a God who is infinite, who has no bounds and has no limits and has infinite resources, how is it a demonstration of love for that God to give anything to the believers, right? Like, like imagine you have trillions of dollars and then someone comes to you and asks you for money and you give them a million dollars. Is it an act of love? Maybe we can say, yes, there is some sacrifice that I'm making, but you have infinite resources. You are not losing anything by giving. Actually, maybe that we would give people simply because we want them to stop pestering us. Stop asking, just take this and go. What is it that, the God, that God did, the good shepherd? What is it that he did to demonstrate love? He was not just a shepherd in the sense that he knows the way and we follow him and we go to safety. He actually sacrificed himself and gave of himself, which required him to, to, to enter into the world, to take on flesh, to suffer as a human being, to die as a human being. And in this way, he offered us a salvation beyond just any kind of worldly blessing. He sacrificed himself in a way that is beyond our ability to even comprehend of how is it that he could do this. This is the manifestation of the love. And where he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. He's saying, I am not here just, um, just at the good times. I'm not here just when things are going well. I'm not here just as an administrator. You know, there is a religion called deism. Deism, they believe in God, but they believe that God is a very distant God. He like created everything and he left it to the, the laws of nature and he just kind of set it in motion and he took a step back and he never really interfered again with the world. This is what deists believe. Of course, this is not at all what Christianity teaches. Right? We believe that God has been extremely uh, and very intimately involved in the world and in each of our lives for the sake of our salvation to restore us again to him. And this is how he demonstrates his love. He made himself to be finite and to suffer, something that is impossible for a deity to experience. It is impossible for a divine being to feel pain. It is impossible for a divine being to die. And yet this is what he did. He took on himself the flesh. He became as one of his creation so that he could suffer as we suffer. So he could relate to us and he say, I know how you feel. I suffered it myself. I felt hunger myself. I felt pain and sorrow myself. I felt rejection myself. I felt all these things. And in this way, come and follow me because I know the way. I know how to get you out of this. I came down from heaven to earth so that I can lead you from earth to heaven. And so those who are wise, the sheep, looking at their own capacity, looking at their own ability, looking at their own knowledge and understanding, looking at themselves, could say, what is it that I can do? I have this person who is coming to offer me heaven. I should follow him. Look how much, like, if you heard of life coaches, these, like, celebrities that coach celebrities and how to live their life, and they make millions of dollars standing up in front of people giving lectures and telling people, like, how to live. So many people pay so much money in order to go to these lectures, tens of thousands of dollars to attend a lecture or a conference, simply because the person on the stage is, is claiming that they know how is it that you should live and be successful in life. How much more, then, if these people are following the celebrity and paying so much money for this, how much more, then, should we, who are receiving it from God himself, for free and yet we look at him and we say I'm not so interested to follow you I have my own path I have my own way I have my own desires and maybe we find ourselves falling into a pit but he demonstrated love to us because he loved us it says we love him because he first loved us our love to him is not initiation of love 
He demonstrated love so that we could then follow him, so that he could guarantee to us that the path that we walk is a good path, one that leads to salvation. Also, he says he is the shepherd of all. He says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So he expresses his desire for the salvation of everyone, not just a group, not just the Jews, but everyone, everyone in the world. This was something unheard of among the Jews all throughout their history. God was the God of Israel. He was the God of Israel only in their mind. He didn't, he didn't seek after the salvation of the others the way that he did Israel. He sent the prophets to Israel. He sent the Messiah to Israel. He sent them the law. He, he's the one who, who manifested himself to them in a very special way throughout all of the Jewish history. But now Christ is saying, I'm offering salvation to the world. And it is through the Jewish people that the Messiah will come, which then saves not just the Jews, but saves everyone. And so he says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, and they will follow my voice as well. And there will be one sheep, or sorry, one flock and one shepherd. And so he is, he's saying that his love is not limited to any group. It's not limited to anyone with any specific characteristics. But every human being made in the image of God is precious to him, and his love is universal. Finally, he calls us to be like him. He also wants us to be shepherds, and he wants us to point to the shepherd. That when we meet other sheep, as sheep, when we go and meet other sheep and we're talking to them, we're like, hey, come and join the flock because we're following the shepherd and he's leading us to a good place instead of just ignoring the, the other sheep, instead of just ignoring the other people. In Ephesians 5, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Meaning, he wants us to have his characteristics. He says, be imitators of God as dear children. Just as the Lord cares about our salvation, he wants us to care about the salvation of all people. Whether it be the people who are in the church now that we serve and we care about them, whether it be the lost sheep, the people who were here at one point and then left for whatever reason, or whether it be the unbelievers that are just all over the world that maybe have no connection at all to the church or to God or to anything, God is saying we are all one flock. He wants us to, to, have, to be one flock and to have one shepherd that we would all follow him together. And so the Lord is also calling us to do our part and to imitate him and to serve the people and to bring them to him. So today we spoke about how the Lord is the good shepherd and how he calls us to follow him because he is good, because he knows the way, because he is righteous, because he serves us in a way that we need. We said that... Um, the first point is that he said that he is the good shepherd and then he said that we are his sheep and the characteristics of sheep are that we cannot lead ourselves, we are in need to follow uh, another uh, and that there are wolves, there are dangers, there are threats, there are attacks, there are temptations that are all around us which makes it dangerous for us to walk on our own um, without following the shepherd. We spoke about the hireling who is unable to save the sheep when the wolves come he runs away that the hireling are the things that we go to to seek comfort and protection in the world that are temporary that are limited that are uh, actually brings us into the bondage of sin these things are the hirelings that cannot save and we spoke about how the good shepherd knows us he knows us as individuals he cares for us as, as individuals and that we also know the shepherd we know his voice we follow him we understand his characteristics he sacrifices himself for the sheep He's demonstrated his love, not just by giving guidance, not just by giving lectures or sermons or commandments, but he did so in a real and practical way by his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection, and that he is the shepherd of all people, and he calls us to be like him. So may God grant us always to know the shepherd and be known by him, and glory be to God forever. Amen.